Tuesday deck, the foaming cleanser. Alka seltzer, plop, plop, fizz, fizz. Oh, what a relief it is. Double your pleasure, double your fun with double the double the double mint gum. Welcome to Common Point, a show for and about communications. I'm your host, Dan Thomas, and this week we return to the Vintage Radio and Communications Museum of Connecticut that's at 115 Pearson Lane in Windsor. This is the second in our series featuring Ed Sachs, who was our head docent, and he's going to continue the tour of this phenomenal museum. Lots of fun things to see. So take it away, Ed. We had talked about uh, telegraphy using wires, and there were some who wondered if it might not be possible to do it wirelessly, especially with the kind of sparks that a thunderstorm might produce. And uh, a lot of people thought about it, but it was Marconi who actually uh, uh, put this application uh, into practice uh, before anybody else. And the way he did that was experimenting at his family's villa in Italy. And uh, when he succeeded in transmitting by spark from one location to another, uh, he, he, the Italian government was in disarray. So his mother said, why don't you go to London where my family makes an excellent whiskey and they'll, they have contacts and they'll help you out. So that's exactly what he did and found himself sending the results, or I should say telegraphing the results of the London, of the Royal Yacht Race to the uh, London Times. Uh, people thought that was pretty neat, but what really caught the attention of those who had the money to spend on this was when he went across to Newfoundland and demonstrated transmission across the ocean. Uh, that meant that people who had invested tremendous amounts of money in ships and related activities uh, uh, had a means of calling for help for rescue or just communicating to each other about the conditions. And uh, uh, this brought a surge in the uh, applications. Uh, and that's where we got the term radio shack, uh, that, because ships were not fitted up with uh, radio rooms at the time. So instead they put a shack at the foot of the mast and uh, uh, led the wire from the antenna uh, that was on the mast down to that shack. Over here we're showing a, a kind of a, 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 a fantasia of uh, wireless with uh, devices that uh, theoretically could receive and transmit uh, and believe me they they don't really do that but they're fun to look at as we go along here uh, we get to uh, uh, where wireless it was in uh, fairly constant operation and uh, uh, also the time of world war one this is a, a typical World War I uh, receiver transmitter uh, carried on the back of a pack animal, which could take you to, to the top of it, the nearest hill and uh, also carry the batteries. So uh, th these things were no, nothing like the cell phone you carry today, although they performed somewhat the equivalent function. The big transition in radio was to, was to uh, vacuum tubes, uh, a tube uh, not unlike a light bulb, but containing two extra elements, a, a plate and a filament to regulate flow between the filament and the plate. And appropriately, that was called a triode. And you can see some of the early triodes here. Uh, over here, uh, we have a device called a Tesla coil. Uh, this one is uh, not powered quite the way he did, uh, but 
it shows the principle, and that is a very small primary coil uh, running at radio frequencies uh, and uh, being uh, 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 amplified, as it were, uh, by a very long coil with many windings on it to produce a high voltage. What you see over here is lighting up the fluorescent green tube uh, next to it, and the sparks that cause it to rotate uh, would, if used in space, uh, propel a spaceship to near the speed of light. This was the original version of the Tesla coil. Uh, rather than use a tube spark uh, a primary, a tube excited primary, I should say, uh, it utilized a combination of spark gap that you see here, plus a capacitor to make a resonant circuit. And uh, that did the trick. Uh, uh, in Tesla's own coil, he would sit in a cage while the sparks from this flew all around him. Uh, and they would be pretty lethal if he weren't inside the cage. And it uh, was quite a fantastic demonstration. This case contains crystal radios, uh, which are exemplified by the one here in front. A crystal radio uh, was one of the least expensive uh, options and uh, involved a, uh, a piece of uh, uh, rock uh, that uh, would conduct electricity only in one direction. And uh, as a result, you could extract the audio signal from the radio signal. And uh, an awful lot of these were made and continue to be made today by visitors to the museum uh, when, whenever we have a, a crystal radio class. Uh, it's a very popular event and those kids leave with big grins on their faces. It's hard to make one that doesn't work. We also had a company here in the Hartford area uh, whose pictures uh, we uh, obtained before we obtained one of their radios, uh, here it is. We obtained that through the internet. And uh, they were active for about three years and uh, must have saturated their market because they didn't stay in business and they didn't progress into tube radios uh, at that time. But it was a nice little company uh, from which we have a lot of information. These, uh, as we've walked around, uh, you uh, may have noticed a lot of these sets having the three dials. And uh, uh, they, uh, they, they, they were not an easy thing to tune. If you didn't put down the dial settings on a piece of paper once you'd found the station, uh, you would be in big trouble because the stations didn't have uh, at, the, uh, at that time uh, regular uh, broadcast. They might uh, be on the air only when there was a, an interesting event uh, to broadcast. Uh, so uh, you had put down numbers that told you which to tune. And as you can see here, I've, I've, I've gotten it fairly roughly. If I went on to tune the others, I could probably get a much better signal. But uh, that was the state of radio uh, in its infancy and the start of broadcasting. This set is called a Radiola Super 8, and it only has two dials. Uh, which makes it a little easier to tune. And the speaker is up above, which is a, uh, a good thing. Uh, as you can see, there are all, were all kinds of speakers available 
uh, for these early sets. Usually the speaker makers were uh, quite independent of the uh, maker of the radio set. And uh, up here, uh, we finally have gotten down to one dial uh, with the Atwater Kent, uh, which was one of the leading radio manufacturers of the time. They uh, uh, started out, uh, as you can see down here, with Bakelite components. Uh, they were experts in Bakelite molding, uh, thanks to their uh, use of it in automobile ignition systems, uh, which is where they got started up. And uh, uh, Bakelite molding uh, consists of taking a powder and compressing and heating it uh, for uh, some time. It's not like the rapid plastic injection molding. It uh, might take uh, 10 to 15 minutes per cycle. Uh, so uh, they were very good at that. A lot of imagination uh, went into the uh, early radios. They weren't just contained in boxes. Uh, they could be contained in uh, useful furniture like this little table for two, which uh, can raise up so that you can access the uh, uh, set inside. There's, uh, uh, from the front, uh, it's possible to tune the radio while you have stuff here on the table and uh, uh, delight in the music that uh, uh, you hope to get. Uh, over here is a, uh, another set that might be used by a clergyman. It's disguised as a set of books. And uh, we open it up. And uh, it's actually a radio. So that would be uh, somebody who didn't want it to be known that he had this perhaps taste in, a, uh, in, in, in an entertainment that might not be acceptable to some of the flock. Uh, on the other hand, uh, uh, some of those very people uh, might have a big set like this to put in the corner of their room and uh, proclaim that they were the proud owners of uh, perhaps one of the larger sets in the community. Over here we have a desk given to us by the widow of a radio repairman. Uh, you can see his reference books here, which contain a diagram uh, neatly laying out uh, the circuit of the set, uh, as opposed to the rat's nest that uh, the actual components uh, present. Uh, the, behind it is a tube tester, because very often that would be the only problem, a, a tube that wasn't uh, functioning right. Usually you could tell by looking at the tube to see if it was lit but sometimes even if it was lit, it wouldn't work for other reasons. And uh, behind me is a typewriter that was used to bill the uh, customers. That was probably one of the most important parts of the setup here. This was an underwood made in Hartford, of course, and uh, uh, one of Hartford's uh, tra traditions. This is the uh, soldering iron that was used. You might think it's better for uh, working on tinning a roof, uh, but back then uh, they were about this uh, size. I know that because uh, back in the uh, uh, early uh, 40s, I carried uh, one of these around on my bicycle, uh, calling myself the roving radio repairman and I'd go to people's houses. Usually it was a tube that needed replacement, but uh, I was always ready with my soldering iron. This set here is an example of uh, one in a cabinet, a very, inort, uh, a very nicely uh, orna ornamented cabinet. Uh, and uh, this was uh, during the time that the Depression was uh, coming along. And when we got to the Depression, the uh, sets became smaller. Uh, and uh, this one was called a cathedral, especially if it were pointed, and represented the 
uh, hopes of getting out of that depression, whereas this represent was called a tombstone uh, uh, by those who felt the depression more keenly. Uh, over here, we're showing a clock radio uh, interspersed with shells. Uh, there's the clock, and down here is the set. And then in back of me is another clock radio, and that's this one over here. <coughs> uh, the clock you can't see, but it's uh, located right in the front, and on the other side uh, is the clock, and uh, up at the top are the speakers. This is uh, one of my uh, favorite shots here. That is a uh, car uh, radio. And uh, the reason is not because of this Atwater Kent uh, uh, car radio, but uh, this picture of a car of the 20s uh, with a radio uh, set assembled along the running board. And the reason why I like this, uh, this, this picture is because I had a car very much like it with the 35 by 5 wheels that would let you get to any picnic spot you wanted. It would even go through small screen, streams. And uh, uh, my favorite place was a forest that was near my home. I used to like to take it through that. Over here you see a lamp radio. Uh, and a uh, humble cigar box model, a kind of a dual uh, standing or sitting accessible uh, version, and sitting only here next to a chair. And to my left here, a most unique refrigerator radio. I'll open it up, turn it on. And there you can hear it in operation. This is the uh, first refrigerator to have a shelf in the door. And you can see that shelf. It also, its uh, ice maker is in here. And that's all it did. It was not, they didn't have frozen foods at the time. And the ice maker would uh, simply provide you with ice cubes. The story behind this refrigerator is that the uh, shelf in the door was not uh, the idea uh, of the manufacturer, Mr. Crosley. Uh, that shelf uh, was uh, presented to him by another person uh, whom, to whom he offered uh, something like $15 for every refrigerator he would make. The guy said, I'd rather have a lump sum, which uh, was somewhere between ten and $15,000. And Mr. Crosley went on to make over a million of these Shelvador refrigerators. When the telephone company moved out of its original facilities in Hartford, they invited members of the museum to come and take uh, away whatever uh, they had left behind. And uh, so that accounts for this uh, section over here with what looks like a switchboard, but actually was used to diagnose uh, open circuits or short circuits that might be in the telephone line and to figure out precisely where they were so uh, as to save time for the repair people. So it paid back for itself very handsomely. To its left, is a uh, generator-like looking uh, device uh, which produced the uh, dial tone or busy signal that you're used to hearing when you pick up the phone. And uh, uh, along here, uh, we have various switch gear which we'll talk about in a little more detail. At this end is a machine that can send printed material. It's called a teletype. And this particular teletype also has the means of storing that printed material on punched tape. And here's an example of the punched tape. And uh, you can see the 
little holes there are not completely perforated. Uh, and there's a reason for that. And that was to pre prevent uh, the uh, accumulation of chad, which was very hazardous if uh, a lot of it got onto the floor. It was very slippery. Uh, this tape, in turn, was the start, or would be later on, the start of a new technology called numerical control. And uh, that technology used tape in order to control machinery. My specialty was machinery that made electronics, so it was kind of like full circle uh, in the manufacturing area. Everybody uh, is familiar uh, with the uh, goddess of the switchboard here, uh, Lily Tomlin. And uh, uh, we are fortunate to have a switchboard exactly like it, except that it wasn't uh, quite as comedic. It was uh, connected to electric boat. In fact, it uh, uh, was located uh, up at uh, Combustion Engineering atomic boiler division. So as you can see, it served a very serious person and you have Admiral Rickover's uh, number here. And uh, you wouldn't want to be caught uh, uh, with a late delivery uh, and have to hear his voice. Uh, it, that was quite a, a production. This is what announces the uh, time of day. Uh, the time is and uh, seven. allows people to set their clocks on distance, uh, Nicholas, properly so everybody seven, could be seven. on time. The time is seven, <laughs> seven. And you can hear that when announcement the rings, there. Give them a chance to answer. Let the phone ring at least ten times. The time is seven, seven. <laughs> what you can see over here is a machine with a rotating drum uh, that could uh, record things. And uh, uh, usually the telephone company would have standard information about uh, weather and other local events. So uh, you could uh, tune into that, dial into that. And uh, it was a great service. It uh, also uh, allowed uh, a broadcast of paramutual results and uh, uh, was a favorite of the uh, betting community. This, uh, this machine uh, down here uh, was used for sending pictures. It had a corresponding machine at the other end, uh, which would record them as uh, fine lines on the, on the drum. And uh, it was uh, not a very... Uh, 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 high resolution machine by today's standards, but you had to start somewhere. Up here we have a machine called a Strogar Relay. And uh, the Strogar Relay automatically was able to do what the operator would do by means of a dial. If I dial two numbers, you'll see the Strogar Relay in operation. Uh, making two contacts, which would uh, enable uh, the user to uh, speak to uh, almost one out of a hundred people. And by the time you get up to six digits, it would be almost one out of a million people. A very powerful uh, tool, which was invented by an undertaker by the name of Strogar, who suspected that his rival, whose wife was the telephone operator in the town, was steering uh, bodies uh, to her husband and was especially convinced of that when he lost his best friend, uh, uh, the, the privilege of bearing him uh, to that competitor. As you drive around, uh, you don't see these things anymore. They're called telephone booths. And uh, in my travels, I had a pager and uh, if it looked like I had to return the call right away, I would start looking uh, for one of these booths. And uh, uh, it was, uh, they were all over the place. 
uh, at the time. This particular one made out of wood, it was an indoor one, and then over at the end, uh, connected to it, is an outdoor one. So if there are two of you and you want to talk to each other, you can try that out here. Thank you for joining us for Common Point, a show for and about communications. We'd like to thank the Vintage Radio and Communications Museum, its director, John Ellsworth, and Ed Sachs, our tremendous tour guide for this exciting adventure through the airs of communication. We'll have more shows from here. Next up, I hope to do a program on interference and noise in communications. For now, for Common Point, I'm Dan Thomas. Thank you for watching. Pepsi Cola hits the spot, 12 full ounces, that's a lot, twice as much for a nickel too. Pepsi Cola is the drink for you. Funding for Simsbury Community Television is provided in part by contributions from viewers like you. Thank you.